I'm Patrice Jennings, and this is Matthew Axton, and we are here at the rehearsal at the Alley in North Hollywood um, for a celebration of Floyd Axton and the 40-year anniversary to him writing Joy to the World. So his uh, band is getting together and rehearsing for a show tomorrow night at the Alley Hotel Theater, and um, Matthew is going to be stepping in for Dad. Feeling as much as I can, yes. yes. Trying to hit the right notes. Yes. Yeah. Yell loud enough to get the point across. Right, song. remember the words, yes, right? That's key. Because God knows he's up there going. That's what the band's for. They can remember that kind of yeah. stuff. I just gotta look like a little more. You know he's up there doing something crazy. Having fun, I know. Yep, obviously. And that's why we're here. Um, so, what is this? This has got to be exciting for you. I mean, yeah, well, I mean, it's a blast to share a million Hoyt stories and meet a, a bunch of faces I haven't seen in a long time. You know, it's, it's yeah. a dream. Yeah, because you were little. When, uh, I was about, Believe it or not, I was little. I was about 16 when you were born, so I'm not telling my age, so don't tell your age. <laughs> Just turned 13, yeah. <laughs> and this, this is Donna Axton. And I played Hoyt, uh, piano with Hoyt from 1976 on. And when I met him, we were married too. <laughs> I forgot to add that part. No, not not originally you were married. You got played, married later. Yeah. He played his guitar and said, I wrote this song, this song, this song. He went through, I've never been to Spain and enjoy the world and no, no song, etc. And then he played Lion in the Winter. And I said, You wrote that because Lion in the Winter is one of those beautiful ballads. Just, he wrote beautiful, beautiful parts about music. So that's when I fell in love with that man. So, and I'm mad. Matthew's mother, and probably the best moment of my life was, I don't know, there's lots of best moments, but Clay was a great kid, kid. <laughs> he loved math. He just loved math. So it was really fun having two kids in the house at the same time. <laughs> a lot of work for you. But, yeah. So I'm still playing the piano, um, still playing all kinds of music, and it's great for me to listen to Matthew singing while I'm playing, sort of reminiscent of that same voice. I'm really glad everybody's here. <laughs> uh, I'm Hank Barry. I'm the guitar player. I was, I've been with them since uh, '78 when I joined the band. Two years right, uh, two years after Mark Dawson joined the band. No, I joined the band in '72. Se oh, '72. Man. Then you must be older than me. Yeah, that's it used good. to be the other way and all around and all of a sudden. Anyway, um, to come back here, it's about people. It's about music and the people that we played with. We, were, it, we played together so long, it was like family. And we are family. And so coming back together is like uh, old home week. And the music is part of the family. Uh, and uh, to pick a favorite, it's like picking a favorite child. But um, <laughs> move along. That would be fine. <laughs> but you know, he would ap approve. He would very much approve of this gathering. And we better play well, or else. <laughs> you better play well. See, I don't have to play. <laughs> Go ahead. You're next. Uh, well, I, I played with Hoyt. I believe between the time that, that you joined the band yeah, yeah. and between the time you joined the band. I don't know the exact year, but I think it was about seven or eight. And you are? I'm Al Johnson. <laughs> Fine guitar player. Oh, no, well, Fine guitar player. Guitar. Coming from this guy, unfortunately I won't be playing tomorrow because I'm going to record the, uh, the deal. So uh, I got it easy. Uh, and then uh, what else? And he also you. produced uh, Hoyt's last uh, studio album, Spin of, uh, Spin of the Wheel, along with Donna. Along with Donna. Great fun. I'm looking forward to hearing. Uh, you were a great help on that too. I'm looking forward to hearing Heartbreak Hotel and uh, I Collect Hearts with Katie Moffat. A lot of stuff I'm going to ah. look forward to hearing too. Yeah. All the stuff we didn't rehearse. All the stuff yeah. we didn't It's going to be fun. Rehearsed, yeah. It's going to be fun. <laughs> and uh, I'm, I'm Dennis Fetcher. I played uh, fiddle for Hoyt. We joined the band in 1978, I believe. Uh, cold called to uh, fiddle player Byron Burline referred me. And I uh, signed up for a seven day tour to Canada. And stay with Hoyt for 12 years, I guess, or 13. Never left, actually. Took over Mark's harmonica spots uh, after Mark left, so I really started doing a lot more things in the band. And that having Hoyt cut my pay, I don't know why, but uh, that's just the way it worked. But I've always had a, had a great time with him, and I've been working at Disneyland five days a week with uh, Billy and the Hillbillies since 1986. Hi, I'm Mark. I am a guitar player, harmonica player, singer. Um, worked with Hoyt um, for a long time. Uh, we won't mention dates because that, that would be... 72, right? Wasn't that the one? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It was 72. We won't mention dates. Yeah. Um, 
It feels great to be back with everybody here. It's, it's bringing back a lot of great memories. And, uh, I'm looking forward to just banging on a guitar and having a lot of fun today. Yeah. You know, this will be fun. This is my wife, Carol. Carol is a background singer. Watch out. I am Carol Dawson, and when I first got in the band, I was Carol Hunt. And the highlight of my career with, uh, with Hoyt was meeting the love of my life, Mark. And we got married, and part of our tour on Hoyt's band was into Germany, and that was our honeymoon together. Yeah. Um, I haven't really done anything in music since 1990, so this will be very exciting. And uh, now I do trapeze. <laughs> Hi. Hi, I'm Jana Lee Eberle. I used to be Jana Lee Eberle, King of Dare Eberle, but now I'm just Jana Lee Eberle. And as I said, I've been with White since 1976 and uh, was with him in, until the end. Um, gosh, this, it's just an incredible event, and it, it is such a family reunion, and so much joy is, is here with us. And uh, I think two highlights for me was I, um, I had two babies while I was working with Hoyt, and uh, he let me perform with him until I was six months pregnant, and then he would tell the audience that he couldn't take the competition. And so I left. And it, the first time uh, I saw him performing at the Palomino without me, and it was the first time I'd ever seen him perform, and it was the first time I'd ever seen the band, so that was... That was a thrill, yes, and uh, the owner of the Palomino kept trying to get Hoyt off the stage. It was after 2 o'clock, and Bill Elkins uh, told Tommy Thompson, uh, are you going to be the one to tell him to get off the stage? And <laughs> So, Buffalo! Buffalo, Bruce Farrell. <laughs> uh, and played the bass in the band on and off for 20 odd years and drove the bus sometimes, like Mark. And Didn't everybody drive the bus? <laughs> yeah. No, fortunately. I've even driven the bus. Oh, oh really? <laughs> Bruce, me and Bruce Barlow were playing with Commander Cody and uh, Commander Cody and Delaney Bramlett uh, the last night of, of the uh, Lake Tahoe. And uh, so me and Bruce were drunk, drunk. No. We were drunk as a skunk, playing our guitars and bass behind our heads. Oh, yeah. When Hoyt walks in, he just happened to be, he fired his whole band. He happened to be looking for another band. He, I got fired. He, he, wa he walks in, and uh, this is the highlight of my career with Hoyt. It was the beginning. And uh, he came backstage, and uh, I recognized him from The Tonight Show. So uh, when I get drunk, I get bold. So Hoyt came backstage, and I, I figured I'm going to go up to him and say, you know, I'm Hank Barrio, and you know, and, and I walked up to him before I can say a word. He was a big, strapping young man at the time, and he comes up to me and says, "You're Hank Barrio, aren't you?" And he shakes my hand like, and my jaw went slack in the gate. In utter awe. And, and, and utter awe in the bit. And then he walked away, and I, I went back to to Barlow, who already knew. He knew Hoyt. He says. I said, hey, he knew me, he knew me, he knows me, he knows me. Well, I fell asleep and forgot all about it. And next morning I get a call and um, it's Hoyt Axton saying he wants to meet with me before I fly out. So he, being the Hispanic that I am, and, and he takes me to a Mexican, a Mexican restaurant and buys half the menu and spreads it all on the big, a giant table and it's just me and him. And, and he goes, well, you know, I want you to play guitar. and. The rest is history. I almost blew it. I said, I don't know if I can do this job. You know, I never played country music in my life. He goes, well, I'll give it a chance. And I saw, anyway, uh, the rest is history. He hired me after that. I think he gave, uh, sent me a airplane ticket in two weeks. I came up and did an album, Rusty Old Halo. And um, one remark on that thing, I think Mark Dawson, he didn't want to hire me. That's true. He didn't want to hire me. He tried to talk Hoyt out of it. Me. He didn't want to hire me either. <laughs> he didn't want to hire me, and, but he, and uh, he hired me anyway, and uh, it's a good thing because me and Mark became best friends. On Hank, that note. Hank was the best man at Carol and my wedding. That's right. That's right. There it is. Yeah. That's close. Well, they're so, only good fellows. I guess I liked you after all. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Reese, uh, and, and I pretended to be Hoyt's drummer for a... Uh, you know, from 1980 uh, and, until the millennium. And uh, how I came together with Hoyt was uh, Corey Bailey, uh, Hoyt's engineer, 
uh, gave him some phone numbers because uh, he needed a new drummer and uh, called me up, Marlene called me up and uh, asked me if I'd like to join the Hoyt band. I uh, didn't know much about Hoyt other than I'd seen his ads in uh, the Palomino and how's the battery, is it good? Because <laughs> I'll get long. <laughs> and so anyway, so, uh, but, but I knew, you know, he was a, a, a real good songwriter, etc. cetera. And so uh, I said, yeah, I'd uh, like to join the band. So uh, 1980, I joined the band and here I am. I've been here ever since, you know, I've never left the room. Amen. It's good to be here with everybody. And I hand, I hand it over to the wonderful bass player, Bruce Barlow, who's to well, Hoyt's, a turn. Well, Hoyt's story was he had bought the old Honeysuckle Rose. It was a 1955 Super Santa Cruiser Greyhound bus, originally a PD-4501 model. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, man. And I was in a band called Commander Cody and his Lost Planet Airmen. We bought the bus in Nashville and had it outfitted by a high school uh, shop, teacher, shop yeah. class. Yeah, and they did it as a school project and put bunks in and all that and eventually we sold it to Hoyt. So Hoyt's story on stage was when we bought the bus, we opened the bay and there was Barlow drunk, so that's how he got in the band. So <laughs> That's how I started playing bass in the band. Yeah. I think that's a true story. Left in the oh, I think it is yeah. too. Well, I, think it is I can't true. remember. So it's real it's authentic sounding to me. Yeah. 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 Since I don't remember probably. I remember you guys teaching me how to drive the bus. Oh. Out in Corpus Christi. Oh, we got yeah. the bus out on the beach. On the highway? Or we know we had the bus on the beach. The beach. And we were driving that bus well, on the beach in Corpus Christi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I thought, man, this thing's going to bog down. We're going to get a bus stuck on the beach. Yeah, we drove it. It was cool. <laughs> I was grinding the gears. It was cool. Biggest beach buggy you ever saw. Yeah, Lance Dickerson and... Um, 20 tons I love. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was exciting. That was terrified. <laughs> I thought, man, this is going to be a disaster. Oh, we got a lot of Good to see you. Hey, Mark. And forever. We had a reunion about seven years ago, and uh, and uh, I, I didn't know that Matthew sang, uh, Hoyt's son, and he, start, he started singing, but he, he, wouldn't, he was really shy, he didn't sing very loud. So I got a call just the other day when, we were, when Donna was organizing this, and she said that, well, you know, you gave advice to Matthew to sing louder because he has a good voice. And so Donna said he took my advice. So I'm, I'm assuming that Matthew here is singing louder. So just to remind him, I bought this picture of, uh, of me and Matthew. That's me on the left. That's me right there. And uh, it's just a reminder to sing louder. Don't be shy. I haven't stopped yelling since. And here he is, strapping young, strapping young man. Where's Corey? Hey, we need an engineer. April Axton Ruggiero, formerly known as April Laura Axton, Hoyt's daughter. Um, thrilled to be here. This is an amazing event for us. It's been 10 years in the making. It's been years in the making, but 40 years of Joy to the World. Um, 
love and peace and joy amongst this family, the band and all the friends and the family being able to come here tonight and celebrate this is just amazing. It's a wonderful thing for us and uh, I just happened to have moved as far away as I possibly could um, a year ago and I flew out here from Rhode Island on two weeks notice and here I am um, celebrating my dad with a bunch of people that love him a lot. Matthew Axton is my baby brother. He was born uh, when I was 16 and he was only 17 when dad passed away and he sung a little bit, never really picked it up. When he was 17, after dad passed away, he taught himself how to play guitar. Then a couple of years later, he starts singing and then he really starts belting it out and we realize not only is he the spitting image of our father, he sounds just like him. He's got his own twist on it, but he's got that same vibrato that my father had and the, the, the bravado that my father had. And um, so if anyone were going to do this, it should be Matthew and he's going to pull it off. Hi, I'm Patrice Jennings and uh, my father, Bob Jennings and Hoyt were close, 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 dear friends. And um, I used to go to the Palomino every time Hoyt played in town and I was at the studios listening to him record and his daughter April and I became best friends and um, when I turned 16 Hoyt had a Rolls Royce and he lived in Tahoe but would leave it here in LA and he'd leave it in my care at age 16 and I would drive his Rolls Royce to my job at the Galleria. It was the craziest thing. I, I think back to some of the things that he entrusted me with and it was a little kooky. Um, my mother and I drove him one time to Tahoe because they wouldn't let planes land uh, land because it was so snowed in and so we packed him in the back of our SUV and drove up to Tahoe and packed with you know all the goodies donuts and every we had to make a you know grocery store stop I think we bought half the grocery store on the way up um, and then you know got stuck in the snow and waited until you know we were able to get through and I think it was like probably about 15 hours it took us but it was like you know Gilligan's Island the 15 hour tour but he was a great man um, dear dear like my second father and we all miss him and tonight was amazing seeing Matthew who I used to babysit, and uh, he did an amazing job, and, and I'm sure that Hoyt will keep passing joy to the world for years and years and years and years and years to come, because he was just that kind of guy, and I know he was here tonight, and we all love him and miss, and miss him dearly. When I was 16 years old, I was the opening act for Hoyt Axon, a powerful, huge man. If you never saw, if you never saw Hoyt, not with a band, but just by himself, on uh, with his foot on the stool, he would, when he tr changed uh, strings on his guitar, he'd do it right during the act. He wouldn't stop. He'd, no, he'd stop and talk. He would actually, once you tied it around, he would bite the ends of the str wire strings off. It was amazing. And he was huge. He was like bigger than life. And later on, uh, we became uh, really good friends. And I worked. Let's see, I worked on a lot of albums as a background singer for him. And my memories of that time were absolutely spectacular. Uh, you know, I was young and impressionable, and he made an impression. And tonight was a, just a joyous, beautiful uh, celebration for his life. And uh, so great to see all my friends and hear all those great songs. David Jackson, David P. Jackson Jr. Boy, used to call me DPJJR. And He'd run out of money, and he had uh, he needed to record some demos so he could get some money from Capital for a publishing deal. So we rehearsed for a week with the Hollywood Living Room Band. That was the start of the Hollywood Living Room Band. Friday went in to record. We recorded all six songs. We had a half an hour left over, and I said, "You've been humming that joy to the world, all the boys and girls, joy to the fishes in the deep blue sea, joy to you and me," and just that's monotone to the rhythm of brown-eyed girl, go figure. And so I said, let me go out there, we got a half an hour, let me go out there and work on this piano part. So I went out and I, I came up with some music and I said, come on out. And he came out and I played him the music that I had and I sang the chorus melody, joy, joy to the world, all the boys and girls. And when we got to the end of the chorus, I, I went bum, 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 and he grabbed a pencil and a piece of paper on the Leslie in the studio and wrote, Jeremiah was a bullfrog, was a good friend. He wrote all three verses, boom, like that. And we recorded it right then. 
took it over to the drummer's house that night and Three Dog Night heard it and the rest is history. But uh, I said, in all my infinite wisdom, let's work on that Jeremiah was a bullfrog thing. You know, that just came right out at just of an instant. It's not really that. We'll work on that. That's how smart I was at the time. I'm Arnie Moore, and I was one of the Hollywood living room band from the uh, early seven through the early 70s. And uh, the groups that uh, I played, broke in with, used to open for Hoyt at various venues around Southern California. And uh, one day I got a call from Hoyt, and uh, he was at his house in Nichols Canyon, and he was uh, playing with David Jackson, who you just met, uh, jamming. Van Jackson was playing piano, and uh, uh, a television announcer named Stan Borman was trying to play drums. And they called me, we need a bass player. So they called me up, and I went over, and we started playing together. And I said, well, I think we need a real drummer. And so I called a friend of mine, and I called another guitar player of a friend of mine um, named Bruce Langhorn. And so Michael Cannon, Bruce Langhorn, David Jackson, and myself were the Hollywood Living Room Band. and. We were with him while he wrote some of his most popular songs, Never Been to Spain, Ease Your Pain, uh, Joy to the World. And one of the stories that I tell is um, about writing Joy to the World. And Hoyt always loved to play his new songs for people. And this is the man who wrote very serious uh, political songs called Epistle and the Indian song and If I Could Ease Your Pain um, and, and great humanistic songs and he was playing for six months he'd take here's my new song Joy to the Fishes in the Deep Blue Sea and I said Hoyt what are you writing songs about fishes in the sea for this is silly and but he kept at it and we went and we recorded a, we, he, he hired a, set, a studio and we went and recorded some demos uh, trying to get a record deal with Capitol Records. And we were very efficient and well rehearsed, so we zoomed through these songs, uh, Ease Your Pain, Never Been to Spain, and four, three other songs. And we had two hours left. And David Jackson says, hey, why don't you uh, go finish that song? So we were stayed in the studio and worked on the music, and Hoyt went into the, into the engineer's booth and came out five minutes later with Jeremiah Was a Bullfrog. And we recorded the whole thing in about, he finished writing the song in another 20 minutes. It took us about 15, 20 minutes to record it. And that session was, we, we got the record deal with Capitol Records. We did two albums for Capitol. And, of course, the first album was called Joy to the World, and um, Three Dog Night had taken it before we uh, released Hoyt's album. But uh, we could never recapture the feel from that demo in the big studio. So what you hear on the Joy to the World album is from that original demo. And uh, that's a little story. Mark Too Good. And... Gosh, I don't know that many clean stories, but uh, one time Hoyt and I were in Montana. We were running late, we had to get here to LA, then we had to go to Canada, and then I'm touring that. We got to drink a little moonshine, which was the first time we had ever done it. So we got out of there late. Hoyt says, we need a shortcut to LA. I said, by golly, I know one. I rodeoed all through this country. I know a good shortcut. So we bailed in the bus, headed up over the Rocky Mountains, Lolo Pass, the same pass that Chief Joseph went on. And we should have gotten fuel, but we somehow forgot it. I think it was the moonshine. And we got over there to White Bird, Idaho, and, and down into Regan's, Idaho. I said, Hoy. I said, we're out of fuel. I said, we don't have enough to get into Boise. We're done. I said, but I got a little town here that we're coming up to, this Regan. So I said, my dad was born here. And I said, I think we can get something done. 
He says, no, no. He says, we, 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 are they going to be open? I said, well, we'll see. We'll see. So we pull in there, and they were having this. It was right on the Salmon River, River of No Return, that uh, Ronald Reagan and, and, and uh, what's-her-name did, uh, Marilyn Monroe. It was called River No Return. It was right on this river. And they were having the races there, the jet boat races. So everybody was in town now. So I stopped and everything, no, no service stations open up, but there was several bars that were open. So I, I said, no, Hoyt, I said, I know some people in this town. I said, I'll go talk to them. We'll get, find the guy that owns the service station. We'll get it open. So I go in there and Hoyt will tell that story. He told it a hundred times. He says, here's this lanky old cowboy. He goes in the first bar and it's in there for about 15, 20 minutes comes out and he's got four or five people with him. And they go into the next bar and comes out and he's got about 20, 25 people with him. He goes into the next bar and he comes out with about 50, 75 people and they're headed for the bus. Hoyt said, what is this crazy son of a buck up to? So I get on the bus and everybody's waiting outside. I said, you just wait right out here. I said, Hoyt, I said, I got the service station owner. I got the mayor. I got the rodeo queens, I've got everybody here. And I said, all they want you to do is sing three or four songs and they'll give us the fuel. <laughs> he says, you rotten little son of a bug. If I get you, I'll kill you. <laughs> so we did, old Hoyt had to sing for his, sing for his fuel. And then by golly, he did it. They had a hell of a time. We had a hell of a time. <laughs> I'm Dickie Davis, I kind of predate uh, with Hoyt, the people that you've been talking to here tonight. I was uh, the light man at the Troubadour in 1962 when Hoyt wandered in from a little place in Downey called the Satter and uh, found a home. Uh, we, uh, we all became very good friends. And uh, on my 21st birthday, started at the Troubadour, uh, I passed out drinking whatever cheap wine they sold there. And Hoyt and a friend of ours called Barry Friedman uh, drove me sleeping in the back seat to Tijuana, where I woke up, uh, with Hoyt sitting cross-legged on the hood of the car and the most squalid scene I'd ever seen outside of a Steinbeck novel taking place in front of me. We spent the afternoon there, and uh, during the time we were there, we picked up uh, some of the largest bottles of rum I'd ever seen in my entire life uh, and hid them under some blankets in the back seat. Hoyt decided to sleep in the back seat and Barry was driving and I was sitting in uh, a shotgun as, uh, as we drove back up into Los Angeles, uh, came to the border crossing at uh, Trilla Vista and uh, had to show our IDs. The, they came up to us and just said, what's your name? And we'd tell them our name. And where were you born? And we'd tell them where we were born. Hoyt was sleeping in the back seat under a Serapi, God help us. And so they saw Hoyt back there and said, uh, what's your name? Hoyt looks up and says, Phoenix, Arizona. And we took a deep breath. We knew he knew what was going on. And the guy said, where were you born? And Hoyt looked at him very carefully and said, Albuquerque? And they arrested us. <laughs> and they uh, took us in and emptied the car out and searched. They had the door panels off the car. They never found the three jugs of rum in the trunk and finally decided that we were all just a bunch of jokers and let us go. And that's hopefully a story that slightly predates all of his success in the bands. And uh, he was a great singer and a great friend and uh, a man of many faces. One of the greatest people I've ever known. My name is Mark Acton. I'm Hoyt's oldest son. Uh, Matthew's big brother. The guy who drove Donna to the hospital when uh, she found out that she was, not to the hospital, but the doctor when she found out she was pregnant. So I've known him since he was that big. I feel like I've been transported back to 1978, except who are all these old people? I'm Heather Axton, and I am Hoyt Axton's niece. He used to tell me I was his favorite niece. I am his only niece. That's what I had to explain to him. And, um, he was, we were all very, very close as a family, so it means so much. The band was part of our family, and this is really a homecoming, bringing everybody here again, so it's really nice. When I was a little girl, Hoyt used to say, come here, Heather. 
stick your, ears, your arms up in the air and turn around. You can trust your Uncle Hoyt. I'm like, you're going to tickle me. You're going to tickle me. And he's like, no, I'm not. And I'm like, okay. And of course he would tickle me. I mean, he was just the most loving uncle ever. And we were really close. We spent a lot of time together, just the two of us sitting and talking. I treasure the, those moments forever. So it, it really feels like a piece of me has been put back together. Like our hearts were all broken when he left. And to bring us all together, I know he's here tonight listening. He's so proud of Matthew and it's just really amazing. I mean, it means the world to me. It really does. Hi, I'm Jennifer Hughes, and uh, I grew up with April, and um, one of my, my, my father was a veterinarian in town, and uh, Hoyt had a lot of dogs, so we became friends through that, and one of my favorite stories and images of Hoyt is him sitting on his bed in nothing but shorts and cowboy boots, the wind, the snow blowing in the window, piling up on the, the four-poster bed, and him just sitting there, half naked in shorts with the, the snow blowing on his head, drinking a bottle of Bosco chocolate syrup and watching a Western. And as like a 14-year-old girl, I'm like, okay, <laughs> if that's the kind of dad you are. I'm, but that's that's point to me is just uh, a big bear in the middle of winter, you know, drinking his Bosco and, and he was quite a storyteller. So he was a great guy and I was very happy to have him in my life. And my name is Sadaki. Sadaki Sugi is the whole name. And uh, I met Hoy way back in 1976 at the uh, Red Wind Indian Reservation in San Luis Obispo. And um, um, I was going back to Japan to get a straighter job. And uh, i never been outside of California, so I asked Hoy when I saw the uh, tour bus, can you take me with you? And uh, he said, well, give me your phone number. So I gave him my phone number. He put in the, uh, his Levi jacket and the bus took off. So I thought that was it. And a couple of weeks later, he called me from Idaho. Hey, you want to come on the road? And then, uh, so I hopped on the Greyhound bus and I met him at the Albuquerque. And uh, after that, I was with him for like uh, almost 20 years. And uh, this is... Uh, Great to have the band reunion. It's been uh, seven, seven years since the last time we had a reunion. So it's like almost like in a time machine, you know, looking at all the people. It's so all of a sudden, I recognize people, but uh, it's all, we are all older. <laughs> but uh, we are just having a good time here and I uh, just can't wait to hear all the great music and uh, all the talented guys in the band. And all the people I know for fans and like all, big old family, you know? So I'm looking forward for the tonight's show.